afternoon. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, my name is Kai Carmody and I'm an associate professor here at Western's Faculty of Law and also uh, the Canadian National Director of the Canada US Law Institute. The Institute uh, was founded in 1976 as a joint creation of Western Law and the Law School at the Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio to examine legal issues of relevance in the Canada-US bilateral context. And to that end, uh, the Institute sponsors a number of activities annually, including the Canada-US Law Institute Annual Conference, uh, the 46th edition of which is taking place online, April 21st, uh, 22nd, on the theme of supply chain challenges for North America. And uh, I want to add that there's free admission uh, for students to that. Um, publication also of the Canada US Law Journal, uh, a copy of which <laughs> I'm holding in my hands, but um, is maybe a little bit hard for some of you to see. Not sure if it's coming through on the screen or not. Um, and periodic uh, experts meetings and distinguished lectures like this ones, as well as our uh, student forums. This, however, is the 14th annual Canada US Law Institute Distinguished Lecture. And this year, our distinguished lecturer is Michael Adams, founder and president of the Enveronics Institute for Survey Research. Michael holds a uh, honors BA in political science from Queen's University and an MA in sociology from University of Toronto. He's the author of seven books on Canada-US relations, including his 2003 book, Fire and Ice, The United States, Canada, and the Myth of Converging Values, which won the 2005 Donner Prize as best book on public policy. Michael is also the recipient of an honorary doctorate and in 2016 was awarded the Order of Canada. I was moved to invite Michael to give this year's Canada US Law Institute Distinguished Lecture uh, while I was reading the newspaper on New Year's Day when he had an, a lengthy opinion piece in the Globe and Mail on differences uh, between Canada and the United States. Just this week, uh, the standoff with uh, truckers convoys in several parts of uh, North America emphasized uh, the vast differences of opinion that have emerged on key issues on both sides of the Canada-US border. And I was interested in where these differences come from and whether they're really in fact so new or if perhaps they've just acquired a sort of new prominence and salience in our thinking. Michael, someone who's been examining these issues in various ways for many years, uh, decades even, and he seemed well-placed to provide some insightful analysis of what's happening and what its implications might be for the future. Before he does that, however, I'd like to convey a few thanks, first of all, to the Faculty of Law and particularly to our Dean, Professor Erica Chamberlain for her continuing support of this lecture to Ashley Wiseman, the faculty's communications officer for helping to promote and publicize this event, and to Corey Meingarten, the faculty's systems administrator, who's ensuring uh, smooth broadcasting uh, of this event, as, as well as my US counterparts uh, on the uh, Ohio side, Professor Stephen Petrus for his continuing support, and the Institute's managing director, Ted Baran in Cleveland. I'd also like to thank this year's students on uh, the Canada US Law Institute Student Committee, particularly Piper Sheehan McGavin, Tanya Soni, and Sharabi Shrikaruna, who've been helpful in coordinating and assisting uh, with this distinguished lecture. After Michael's distinguished lecture today, there's going to be an opportunity for questions from the audience through Zoom. So if anyone would like to send along a question or two during the lecture or thereafter via the Q&A function at the bottom of the webinar screen, that would be appreciated. So without any further ado, over to Michael. Well, thank you for those kind words, Kai, and uh, great to be with you and uh, your colleagues <clears throat> at Western and elsewhere this afternoon. Um, I'm going to, for about half an hour, 35 minutes, walk you through some uh, a PowerPoint. I hope it's an interesting PowerPoint, not a boring one, not filled with words, but more pictures and, uh, and concepts. 
Um, and then uh, I'll look forward to the, the Q&A afterwards. Well, <clears throat> the US and Canada have always been distinct cultures since, since their of colonial days, their founding by the Europeans uh, several centuries ago. And, and they have been on unique uh, sociocultural trajectories. Uh, as we look at the broad picture over, over history, we see Americans as being a more risk-taking people and Canadians are more risk averse. Uh, America is a culture of aspiration and Canada, a culture of accommodation. Interestingly, we started out more religious than the Americans, certainly the, the uh, French Canadians in Quebec, uh, but these days it's the Americans who are more religious and, and Canadians uh, more secular. Uh, for America, money is everything. Again, this is a bit of a stereotype. For us, money is suspect. Did you inherit it or get a government grant? How, could, how else could you get money in this country? Uh, Americans brag the highest standard of living in the world. We think we have the, the best quality of life. There, the winner takes all. Here, we distribute the winnings and income redistribution. Americans think they'll win the lottery. We think we have won the lottery. We're Canadians, we're in Canada. In America, philanthropy, again, this is kind of tongue in cheek, is more capricious in the sense that huge uh, bodies of wealth um, are uh, eventually established foundations and, and then distributed to do good things. Um, get noticed by Bill and Melinda Gates and you've made it. Um, our philanthropy is not uh, capricious, it is uh, compulsory philanthropy and it's known as uh, higher levels of taxation, which goes to the government and then gets distributed uh, around the country and to various groups in the country. Interestingly, uh, American humor tends to be more put down humor, more slapstick, more Three Stooges kind of thing where they, the, gag, the bad guy uh, gets his comeuppance in the end. Uh, we've inherited from the Brits, I think, a self-effacing irony. We tend to say the opposite of what we believe. Um, and, uh, and, whole, and then uh, almost as a test to see if the other person is smart enough to, to get our drift. Uh, in America, the word liberal has become an epithet. It's, it's a put down of someone. In Canada, a liberal, being a liberal person, is actually a compliment. And there's even a political party that calls itself the Liberal Party that seems to do pretty well in elections. So here, the word liberal is, is normative. And you all will have your own kind of binaries of US, Canada, some stereotypes, some historical, uh, some lessons from history. Um, but these are the ones that I've pulled together just to kind of spark us uh, at the beginning of my lecture. Uh, so I like arguing from data. And I start with data that's derived from surveys, from survey research. And, uh, and in particular, when it comes to comparing cultures, I use our social values research. And values are, you know, they sometimes say that a bad person has no values, actually a bad person, somebody you think is bad, does have values, we just don't like their values. So we try to look at the broad range of values, uh, motivations and mindsets. Uh, in other words, the things in our head that inspire us as parents and, and guide us uh, as, as consumers, as workers, as investors, um, as spiritual beings, as, as voters and so on. And we do this by creating a number of statements that are put together in a questionnaire and anywhere from one to three or four, or even five statements are put together and, uh, and become a single social value that we track over time. Now we've done this work um, in Canada and the United States at the same time since 1992, although we began the program in 1983 in Canada, but in the two countries it's been uh, since uh, 1992 and then 96, 2000. So it's every four years. And of course, those of you who pay attention to politics knows, no, those are 
presidential election years. So it's uh, we often then can correlate the the values with uh, people's political uh, preferences. In 2020 and 2021, these last couple of years in Canada and the U.S., we've used more than 150 items to track 60 social values in the two countries, and we have very large samples of 5,000 or more in each country, which allows us to break down uh, by demographics, you know, by age, uh, gender, income, education, uh, region of the country, and so on. And you'll see some of that in my uh, in my presentation. So the examples of values that we are tracking, <clears throat> starting with A, uh, acceptance of violence as, as normal in life, adapting to complexity, the American dream, everybody knows what that is, anime and aimlessness, two very good sociological concepts, attraction for crowds, uh, authoritarian impulse, one we've added over the last 10 years, uh, conspiracism, the belief in conspiracies, uh, that they're true, or a lot of them are true, doing your duty, ecological concern, flexible families, um, blended families, um, same sex, uh, same gender families, you know, Adam and uh, Steve, as well as Adam and Eve, uh, ethical consumption, global consciousness, modern racism, the belief that there is no more racism, We've solved racist problems and everybody has starts from the same uh, starting point. Uh, ostentatious consumption, also termed conspicuous consumption, patriarchy, which we'll be talking about a little bit more, a penchant for risk, a love of taking risks, rejection or questioning of authority, religiosity, sexism, sexual permissiveness, um, technological anxiety and, and xenophobia, the, the fear or even hate uh, toward the other. So when we, um, over a number of years, putting uh, these uh, studies together and looking at the values and the direction in which they're going, uh, we create a chart like this uh, with two axes, an X and a Y axis, with at the top of the this sociocultural map are people oriented to traditional authority People at the bottom of the map are people who are questioning traditional authority and often rejecting it. At the left of the map, we have more, a more Darwinistic uh, place, uh, survival of the fittest, Hobbes' state of nature, nasty, brutish, and short. And on the right side of the map, uh, we have people who are really post-materialists uh, on the Maslavian hierarchy. They're uh, uh, questing a spiritual meaning in their lives, they feel fulfilled, and now they they want to uh, uh, achieve um, uh, that spiritual uh, peace and tranquility. When you cross the two, it gives you four quadrants, and and they each describe a, a mental posture or a way of looking at the world. So, people with a survival of the fittest and an, and, and a deference to traditional authority find themselves in the upper left hand quadrant. And we label that one the status and security quadrant. These are people who obey traditional norms and, and, uh, and adopt traditional structures. In the upper right uh, hand side of the map, uh, again, people are deferential to traditional authority, but they're more on the fulfillment side. So for them, the quest is for authenticity and responsibility. Uh, this is... Uh, the area of uh, where people are oriented to, to well-being, uh, harmony, and responsibility. You can think of uh, Oprah, Oprah's quadrant. Uh, in the lower right is kind of the boomer quadrant, the baby boomer quadrant. Uh, these people are oriented to idealism, uh, that there can be a better world and we ought to be headed in that direction. They are also into individual or personal autonomy. They're into exploration. They like uh, differences. They they uh, they like travel. They like going to different ethnic restaurants. They like meeting different kinds of people. And they're and they're very flexible and try not to be judgmental about difference. In the lower left, individuality, but more in the survival of the fittest quadrant, we have people who feel excluded from the major culture. Um, they feel like they're outsiders. 
They quest intensity. They like feeling the lifeblood flowing through their veins. They seek, seek stimulus, constant stimulus, and, uh, and constant attention. So with those concepts in your mind, I'm now going to show you where the Canadians and the Americans are on this map. So 1992, uh, the first year that we did the studies in both Canada and the United States. So the average American, when you did our sample of whatever it was that year, 2,000 or 3,000 people, the average American in 1992, we found just above the map, just inside the authenticity and responsibility quadrant. The average Canadian in 1992 wasn't too far away, but was distant and was um, also um, to the right, you know, more toward the fulfillment side, but further down the map, further in uh, rejecting or questioning authority and more in the idealism and the autonomy quadrant. In the year 2020, the last wave we did in the US, we find that the average American has come way down the map. In other words, way down from uh, embracing traditional authority, more into individuality, but rather than continuing in a direction toward fulfillment has actually regressed and has moved more toward a Darwinistic survival of the fittest orientation. And the average American then is found in the exclusion and intensity quadrant. Where are, where is Canada in 19, uh, 2021, which is the last year we did uh, the study here, is again, way down the map, again, moving from a, a deference to authority to individuality, and, but is in much deeper uh, in the idealism and autonomy uh, quadrant. So the direction of social change in the United States from the point of view of the values of the average American and the direction of social change in Canada for the average Canadian. So on what values then are Canadians and Americans most different? What distinguishes what Canadians and Americans most value as distinct from uh, what the other culture values. So number one for Canadians, a sense of duty, doing your duty to others, uh, a questioning or rejection of authority, uh, the automatic deference to authority that uh, used to be characteristic of Canadians, uh, flexible families, so much, very open to blended families, to uh, again, uh, gay families and so on. Uh, a post-material mindset uh, and less oriented on, on consumption uh, and more on uh, uh, experience seeking than uh, materialism. A belief in saving on principle, that is, it is a good thing. And as consumers, they are discriminating consumers. They give thought to whether or not they actually need the product. And then they also are looking at you know, is this something that's, uh, uh, that, that's consistent with my values that I'm going to purchase? The average American is stronger on religiosity, stronger on patriarchy. And we're going to look a little bit more depth at patriarchy in a minute or two. That is patriarchy as measured by uh, the father of the family being the master in the house. Traditional family, um, more than the flexible families. In other words, mom, dad and 2.5 kids with the dad on top, mom, you know, uh, best actress in a supporting role and the kids uh, are further down the hierarchy of authority. Confidence in big business, the need for status recognition, stronger for Americans. And of course the symbols of your status in the society are shown through ostentatious consumption, whether it's the car you drive, the house you have, Whatever you have, it's going to be a symbol of your place in the status hierarchy. So let's have a look at patriarchy. The first institution that any of us experiences in this life is the experience is the family, and and uh, so it is important that we understand what people think is the natural structure of authority in the family, because they're going to carry that model through to other institutions, uh, whether it's political institutions or at the workplace or whatever, 
that model is going to be a model that will be applied in other settings. So that's why we put so much emphasis on, uh, on the structure of authority in the family. So in 1992, when we did our survey, we found that 42% of Americans uh, felt the father of the family must be master in the house. Now, I guess our hypothesis was, why would there be any difference between <laughs> Canada and the United States? I mean, we'd all been exposed to father knows best. You would think patriarchy would be one of those international things and that people in Canada, the US and the North American continent with so much similarities in their culture would have a very similar orientation to the structure of authority in the family. Well, in 1992, we found that 25% of Canadians, uh, and I remember you know, presenting this and people said, you know, your surveys have a margin of error. You better check this out. So four years later, we checked it out again. And uh, the proportion of Americans thinking father must be master had actually gone up in, the, in Canada. It had actually receded and gone down. And so the gap was even wider. Well, two observations were, are terrific, but you really need three to be able to, to know really if it's a systematic uh, a change where you can actually put a vector on a map and say, okay, that, that's the direction it's going. So now we're in the year 2000. We have George Bush taking on Al Gore. Uh, Americans are up at 48% father is master. And, uh, and the Canadians are now at 18, so it's getting wider. So you can imagine after a, you know, nearly, a, nearly a decade of seeing this kind of thing, I am inspired to say, I've got to dig deeper. What does this correlate with? Um, what, is, what does this mean about the two cultures? That 48%, by the way, uh, highly correlated with voting Republican, for, with voting for George Bush in that election of 2000. And then we've asked the question, in subsequent years, it goes after 2004, this uh, goes up to 52% in the United States. Now we've, America, of course, has, has gone through 9-11. Uh, America's gone through the war in Iraq and so on. And that these could be factors in explaining why you get even a, a, a higher proportion for patriarchy. Canada is now a bit up from the 18% in, the, in, in uh, 21. And then we've continued it on, you know, 2007, uh, 12, 16, and 20. Uh, there's actually an interesting low point here, 2012. This correlates, of course, with uh, Obama, the first Canadian uh, president of the United States being in power. Uh, but when you're soon back up to 2016, the US is back to its normal position of being about half the electorate. This is the election which uh, Trump won, and then 2020 down one point in the U.S. is statistically insignificant. The Canadian numbers are hovering at you know 20, 23, 24, and so on. And we attribute this to immigration. We have 20% foreign born, 40% first or second generation people coming to Canada tend to come from more religious countries and more patriarchal countries. It takes a, you know, a generational change before um, immigrant kids uh, have the values that are the same as uh, a native born um, in Canada. So looking a little deeper, um, this is uh, the 2020 survey in the US, 58% of American men think father must be master, 41% of women. When we compare that to Canada, it's quite striking that 32% of Canadian men think father must be master, which is lower than the proportion of American women who think father should be master. And look at Canadian women at 16%, only 16% believing that the father of the family should be the boss in the household. These are a pretty remarkable uh, comparison. We look at religion and we look at religion because we hypothesis would be that religion should trump country as if forming, as helping to form your social values, the things you think are right and wrong and how to live your life and so on. So we thought, wouldn't it be interesting to compare people's, people of various religious denominations in the two countries? 
So conservative Protestants in the United States find themselves up in the authority quadrant, the status and security uh, 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 sector. Um, mainline Protestants in the US are again up the map more toward authority, you know, but they are in the authenticity and responsibility quadrant. Uh, Catholics in the US, interestingly, uh, uh, more toward the survival, the fittest, this probably has something to do with um, a race, racial and ethnic uh, composition of the Catholic population. Uh, Non-Christians, <clears throat> so we're looking at Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs in the United States, down the map, interestingly, people with no religion, are right down on the idealism and autonomy quadrant, um, the Canadian quadrant, interestingly. When we look at Canadian conservative Protestants, and these are you know, evangelicals, uh, born again Christians and so on, our hypothesis was gonna be that they would be very similar to conservative Protestants in the United States. You would think that religious ideology or belief system would uh, be stronger than any, uh, than the country in which people live. And we were quite astounded to see that conservative Protestants are in Canada are quite different in, in social values uh, from their uh, co-religionists in the United States. Mainline Protestants, right in the middle of the idealism and autonomy quadrant, Catholics, interestingly, very in Canada, very similar to mainline Protestants. Uh, whereas again, Catholics in the US and mainline Protestants are, are quite different. In, social values profiles. Muslims, Sikhs, and Hindus, and, and others uh, in Canada, further down the map. <laughs> and people with no religion are off the map. They're so far down in questioning traditional authority and uh, in this idealism and, and autonomy quadrant in Canada. So we look at values, of course, but there are other concepts in our mind, there are opinions and attitudes and behaviors and so on that we do. Uh, here we look at a bunch of statements that kind of express the mental posture of what people are thinking about their country today in each, and you'll see that they do reflect uh, the values differences uh, that we see in, um, that we've seen earlier. So here's a statement to which people have to agree strongly or somewhat or disagree strongly or somewhat. Uh, agreement that the state of the country, in this, in this case, the state of the United States, is in, uh, is in moral collapse. The country is in moral collapse. Three quarters of Americans believe that. Uh, Canada is still pretty high. It's 47%, but quite a, quite a difference. Um, things are going in the right direction in the country, uh, a positive statement to which only 28% of Americans agree that the country is going in the right direction. Uh, whereas you know, a majority of Canadians think the country is going in the right direction. And this is in 2021, uh, in which the Canadians are actually in the, right in the middle of, a, of, their, of the pandemic. Uh, our country is on the edge of bankruptcy. 60% of Americans think that. Only 40% of Canadians do. Um, interesting, given the amount of money that the Canadian government is uh, spending and borrowing and so on to get them, get the country out of this uh, pandemic. Uh, abortion should be safe and legal. This is interesting in the context of uh, the decision that's going to come down uh, from the Supreme Court in the next week or two. 66% uh, of Americans agree with that statement. 81% of Canadians agree that abortion should be safe and legal, which, uh, it's, uh, which is the case. Uh, in uh, most of Canada and in large parts of the US currently. Uh, Black Lives Matter movement is bad. Of course, it started in the United States after George Floyd was uh, murdered. 46% um, of Americans actually think Black Lives Matter is bad for America, uh, but only 31% think Black Lives Matter is bad for Canada. Uh, again, it's a significant, statistically significant difference. And then conspiracism, or the idea that most so-called conspiracy theories you read about are true. 33% of Americans believe that, and 19% of Canadians. So as you can see, these attitudes, you find the attitudes in Canada, it's just that 
a larger number of Americans have a lot of the more negative attitudes about their country and the direction it's going. So this does lead Canadians um, to have a, a rather, uh, well, lately, a, a rather ambivalent attitude to the US. But this is one of the questions that has the longest time series in our surveys. Uh, Ronald Reagan was uh, president in 1982 and Pierre Trudeau in this country. And at that time, 72% uh, in 82 had a favorable, of Canadians had a favorable uh, view of the United States as a country. Um, and only 17% had an unfavorable view. And that obtained, as you can see, right up until uh, the turn of the century, the, the new millennium. Uh, when, um, and you could, I would think it's the election of George Bush, it's, it's uh, the Iraq war and Canada not joining, uh, not believing the evidence uh, that there were uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, kind of seeing America becoming uh, more militaristic, getting itself in, involved in, in wars like Iraq and then Afghanistan and so on, to the point where by 2006, uh, Canada, Canadians were divided on whether or not they had admired or didn't admire the United States. Well, then we, we get Obama gets elected, and I guess Canadians are feeling that Americans can, can get on a good track. And then, of course, we see the effect of Trump being elected, uh, the deep divisions between Republicans and Democrats, the culture wars become greater uh, to the point where um, in, 20, uh, uh, in October of 20, we were at down at, at only 29% with a positive view and 63% with a negative view. Well, Biden then squeaks out a, a victory and we think, okay, they're coming back to their senses, but we're nowhere near the kinds of uh, numbers that we had in the 80s and 90s in terms of admiring America. Now the country is Canada, Canadians are split 50-50 on whether they have a favorable or unfavorable attitude to the United States. Um, we ask Canadians, we don't ask Americans how they would vote in a Canadian election. They would not know, know how to answer that question. Uh, but you can sure ask, ask Canadians how they would vote in uh, an American election. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Uh, I put up all the, the elections for which we have data from 88 on. And it's interesting, back in 88, we were, when it was Dukakis versus uh, George Bush, George H.W. Bush, uh, we were kind of split, uh, you know, 33, 31. Uh, but by 1992, when Bush, uh, Clinton took on Bush, we actually uh, favored George Bush, the president we knew, uh, over uh, Bill Clinton, the Democrat. But after four years in office, um, and with America then starting to have early evidence of quite severe uh, divide uh, politically, uh, we were overwhelmingly in favor of Clinton over Dole, uh, favored Al Gore over uh, George W. Bush, 48 to 29, and, uh, and then uh, Kerry over, over Bush uh, in the 04 election, uh, Obama, of course, was overwhelmingly supported by Canadians in, in 2008 and 2012. Um, and then uh, Hillary, uh, again, a big margin over Donald Trump and, uh, and Biden over, over Trump. 15% uh, of Canadians uh, would have voted for Donald Trump uh, versus 67% uh, of, of uh, voting would have voted uh, Democrat. It, this is fascinating, and for people in Alberta may find it even more fascinating, that um, all Canadian provinces uh, would have voted Democrat. Uh, and in fact, other than Alberta, the Canadian provinces are more Democrat than any state in the United States. The only region of the U.S. that's even more Democrat than, than the Canadian provinces is the District of Columbia, which they may or may not make a state. Um, and even Alberta is up there with the states that are the most strongly democratic. And that's astounding because Trump said he would keep the Keystone pipeline and Biden said he would get rid of it. So it 
it was clearly in, in the economic interest to have uh, for Albertans to have uh, Trump elected. Uh, but even so, um, uh, uh, Biden was the uh, was this, it was the uh, overwhelming favorite, uh, even in Alberta. If you compare Canadians, Americans, um, where they are on an ideological divide. So this uh, in in the U.S. we don't use liberal and uh, we use liberal and conservative. In Canada, you don't use liberal and conservative because that's the name of political parties. You use le left and right uh, on the spectrum. Um, this we did. Um, just uh, recently, and uh, find Canadians uh, lumping in the middle. You know, the old joke, why does a Canadian cross the street to get to the middle, right? Uh, and uh, the middle of the road. Only 4% of Canadians put themselves on the extreme left of the ideological spectrum, and only 4% put themselves on the extreme right of the ideological spectrum. And the large plurality of Canadians are are in the middle. In the U.S., you can see far more uh, self-identification ideologically with the extremes. Twelve percent on the left, on the extreme left in the U.S. Seventeen percent on the extreme right in the United States, uh, with only eighteen percent, uh, barely one point more than the uh, in the middle. Of barely one point more than the people on the extreme right. So this gives an example of the of the ideological orientation of Americans versus Canadians. With Canadians again uh, showing the uh, the stereotype of being people who hover toward the center of the map. And and this is expressed in the in the ideology of the various uh, supporters of political parties. So looking in Canada. When we ask Canadian uh, conservative voters, where are you on the political spectrum or where does the analysis show they are? Obviously, very few are going to be on the on the left uh, ranked, you know, one, two or three on the ideological spectrum. The majority, 62 uh, percent uh, are in the center and 35 percent on the right. Twice as many uh, self-identified conservatives are in the center. And of course, this <laughs> this is obviously uh, led us to think, uh, as the Conservatives are about to choose a new leader, um, if they choose a leader who uh, represents the right of the party, uh, that person will have the challenge of holding on to the right, but also uh, appealing to the 62% who see themselves in the center of the, of the spectrum. Among Liberals, it's as expected, 63% are in the middle, with 21% on the left, 16% on the right. That's classic profile of the Liberal Party. New Democrats more likely to be on the uh, extreme left, uh, but even there, the majority of New Democrats are, uh, are centrist, 58% and only 9% on the right. In the US, of course, it's much different. The Republican Party, 85%, the sorting of uh, ideological sorting there has put 85% uh, of people who consider themselves uh, to the far right um, our, uh, our, uh, that's a profile of the Republicans. Independents, as you would expect, uh, are more centrist in the United States. And then Democrats, uh, interestingly, on the, seeing themselves on the liberal left, 60% versus 35. Um, and of course, that's how Biden gets himself. He's ruling from the center, uh, representing, doing well to represent the 35. Uh, and he's off, he often has trouble with the 60% the who see themselves on the, uh, on the extreme left of his party. So all of these values and politics add up to um, very different orientations to satisfaction with uh, democracy in their country. So uh, these are, this is uh, the, the numbers for uh, Canada. As you can see, it's 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 varied a bit, but generally it's you know in the in the seventies uh, who are satisfied with the way democracy runs in our country. Um, in America, it's about half of the population are satisfied with the uh, the way their democracy works, uh, and um, these are the proportions. It's about one in four who are uh, dissatisfied 
uh, with the way democracy is running in Canada. Uh, but in the US, it's, it's nearly half of the population. Um, and this has, again, been consistent you know, throughout the decade or so that we've been asking this question. It does correlate with uh, partisanship in the United States. If your party gets in, then you're satisfied with the way democracy works and the way elections work. If your party doesn't win, more and more you're thinking, well, the election was rigged. And as we know, the majority of Republicans now think that Trump actually won the election of 2020. Uh, this is not the case in Canada. When liberals win, conservatives say, they don't say the election was stolen. They say, you know, it's, uh, they don't like it, but they, they don't blame the political system uh, for the fact their, uh, their party didn't win. And then finally, Americans and Canadians orient, orientation to self, society and authority, which I presented here, uh, is reflected also in people's willingness to be vaccinated against COVID-19. 64% are fully vaccinated, that's two shots uh, in the United States and in Canada, it's 80% uh, who are, um, have, their, uh, have their two shots. Um, and again, a lot of it has to do with orientation to authority, orientation to political, the political institutions, political leaders, science, put it all together and you get significant differences. And of course there are significant differences on, on such dimensions as uh, uh, people getting uh, COVID, uh, people having to go to a hospital, and of course people dying from COVID and the proportions are uh, uh, reflected in the proportions of people who've, uh, who've actually been, uh, got vaccinated. So um, that's the PowerPoint version, um, but there are books and you are students and so you know all about books. Uh, as Kai referred to, my Fire and Ice book, I then did a book on American backlash, tried to explain why you were seeing this backlash toward the progressive era of the 60s and 50s, 60s and 70s in the United States. Um, then of course, after the election of Trump, I knew Canadians would wonder, could it happen here? So uh, that morning we, we went to bed, not really knowing that Trump had beaten uh, uh, Clinton, but the next morning we knew it and I banged out a, a book proposal and. Uh, Publisher told me to write a book in three months, which is hard to do, but I did it. And that one was published uh, in 2017. And then Kai and I are both writing chapters for the Canada and the United States book, Differences That Count, and that'll be published uh, later this year. Uh, each of us will have an essay in, uh, in that book. And then, uh, and then the article that Kai referred to, the, um, uh, that I published in the Globe and Mail, um, on January 1st, so you can Google that, and uh, that's a nice, I don't know, 1,200 word summary of a lot of this. And uh, and then there's our website with survey after survey and study after study and chart after chart, uh, uh, telling us all where we are on the, on the spectrum, where our country is going, and for our comparative stuff, where we are vis-a-vis -vis the United States, and we do compare ourselves to Europeans and other countries, OECD countries, et cetera, in our research. But uh, for today's discussion, it was a Canada-US uh, comparison. So um, so I think that's, uh, th that's the formal part of the presentation. Now the fun begins with Q&A. So uh, I look forward to uh, hearing from Kai and others who are listening in. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, as I said uh, at uh, the beginning of this session, uh, there's an opportunity for questions from the audience through Zoom. So if anybody would like to send along a question or two uh, after um, in the, uh, the Q&A function at the bottom of the webinar screen, uh, please feel free to do so. I guess to begin with, uh, <clears throat> Michael, a, a couple of questions. I mean, uh, as uh, a Canadian, but also as an American um, who has lived in Canada for most of his life, uh, I think it's uh, certainly true that while there are a lot of differences between us, there are also a lot of similarities. Mm -hmm. um, and if anything serious were to happen in the U.S., like uh, a disruption of government, uh, like a uh, insurrection, uh, like a secession, um, Canadians would have a really tough time. Uh, we 
Uh, saw that just last week uh, with the blockades at key bridges and uh, the fear that uh, these blockades, if they continue, are going to lead to layoffs and higher prices and the importation of extremism. Mm -hmm. And so I guess uh, a question that, uh, that I think many people might have is uh, whether or not there is anything uh, in your view that uh, Canada um, can offer to an increasingly inward looking, preoccupied and internally divided United States? Uh, not much. <laughs> uh, Americans are going to have to solve their own problems. They have their own unique uh, history, their unique constitution, their unique history with slavery and subsequently Jim Crow and so on, which is a, a lot to do with the, the divisions in that country now. Um, I would suggest that Americans are going to have to work this out themselves. And I am, unlike some Canadians, I'm not uh, so pessimistic uh, to believe that America is going to have another civil war. It, it's, it's, going, it's, it's going to be a very low grade civil war. There, there, of course, there will be killing. Um, you can't not have killing when you've got 400 million guns and 300 million people. Uh, highly armed, you know, who are, have got the right to carry arms in public, they can go to demonstrations with guns, you know, and so the chances then of, of violence happening and violence even in, in the election of, of 20, well, I don't know this uh, in the midterms, whether we'll see it, but uh, in the presidential election, I suspect it'll happen. Um, and then I guess what we're, we're really going to be looking at is, will there be a backlash to the backlash? Um, will the minorities and the liberals and all the other members of the co Democrat coalition be able to uh, appeal to the independents and to Republicans who uh, reject, who are traditional Republicans with traditional values and are not populists. Um, and uh, so will, uh, will the country go through some form of civil war, but uh, without it being, you know, the, the uh, what we saw in, in the 1860s with, you know, three quarters of a million people dying in, in that civil war. So uh, I don't, uh, Americans, it's, it's a joke, they uh, tend to be benignly ignorant of Canada. Of course, Rick Mercer showed that with his comedy series, talking to Americans. Um, and, um, yeah, and there are, but there are Americans who dislike Canada for, you know, the Soviet Republic of Canada and so on. We've been teased uh, by uh, people on Fox News and so on. Uh, Trump has ridiculed our, our prime minister um, and, and ridiculed the country itself. Um, so I, I would say then that, um, that Canada really, given that we're not really on the radar um, really doesn't uh, represent a model. You will find editorialists in the New York Times and the Washington Post point out, you know, that the Canadians have gun laws and that, that serves them well and they have a, a universal health care and that leads them to live five years longer than the average American and so on. But it doesn't really inform Americans and give them a model that they say we want to emulate. Um, if anything, they may... They may have a view of Europe um, and, and the, the, the social democracies of Germany and France and, and Britain, that may be more of a model for them even than Canada, but they do know we exist, but I don't think that in fact, we have an impact uh, on, um, on how they vote. And I don't recommend uh, getting in your car and driving down to Ohio and knocking on the door of a Republican and saying, I'm a Canadian and I think you ought to vote for you know, Biden. Uh, you'll probably find you get a, a punch in the nose and say, why don't you take, you, <laughs> you people have enough trouble with your truckers. Why don't you go back and talk to them and leave us alone? So um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not optimistic that Canada offers a model that, um, that an American politician could put in the window and said, okay, Here's the model. Let's be more like Canada. There will be some people like that. Um, certainly, I have, I have business interests in the United States. And of course, you know, uh, my business partners there are people that, you know, are saying that they uh, admire the country, but they're not going to leave America. 
um, they're going to stay there and uh, and stay politically engaged and and try to be part of the backlash against the backlash. Another uh, another way, perhaps, of um, asking uh, asking the a slightly different question is um, that um, on a lot of metrics, um, as you pointed out, like quality of life or general education or lifespans, um, Canada actually outranks the United States. And mm -hmm. what do you think uh, the secret sauce of Canada's success is? Um, and is there any way to sort of, you know, uh, package this and export it? Uh, or uh, should we just take um, pride in, in uh, a successful social model? Well, in this course, um, I could give you a book as an answer, but you don't want to hear me read a book. But that's when I write Fire and Ice and when I write American Backlash and so on, Sex in the Snow earlier. I mean, I, I start when you, you do polling, but you must go beyond the polling and look at the history and how have these countries behaved in the past. So let's start with the Canadians and their story, their colonial story is that when the British beat the French in 1759 on the Plains of Abraham, uh, they couldn't really inflict their values on the, uh, on the country because there weren't many Englishmen there. <laughs> they, they were French. And so the first thing that the British did was accommodate Quebecers. And they said, you can keep your language, you can keep your culture, you can keep your religion, um, and just be good Canadians. And it actually, the British compromise uh, with the French Canadians was a big factor in their not joining the 13 American colonies uh, because they had a pretty good deal from the Brits. And uh, why would they join a Protestant country when they could still be a Catholic region of uh, under, under British rule? And so they, they stuck with the British crown and did not join the 13 colonies, even though Ben Franklin actually came up to Montreal and tried to sweet talk them into, uh, into joining them. Um, so that, that uh, history then, uh, and this is between the colonial powers, uh, the French and the English, of mutual accommodation, uh, that then starts to become part of the Canadian DNA. And I then, you know, race forward to uh, the period where we are bringing in people from all over, well, all over Europe, uh, starting in the 1890s and into the early part of the 20th century, to fill up the vast expanse of the Canadian West. Um, and we needed Europeans and not just Brits, uh, but uh, uh, Eastern Europeans. And of course, those people come to uh, fill up Western uh, uh, Canada, Ukrainians, Poles, and other Eastern Europeans. When, when Quebec, um, the Quiet Revolution happens in the late 50s, early 60s, and French Canadians assert themselves and say they don't want to be second class citizens in Canada anymore. The mutual accommodation continued. We had a Royal Commission on bilingualism and biculturalism, and we brought in a number of policies that, um, that kept Quebec in Canada. At the same time, the ethnic groups that were neither English nor French said, well, we're Canadians too. And, um, and we thought, you're right. Um, it's not biculturalism, it's multiculturalism. And multiculturalism is mutual accommodation between all of the cultures of Canada, not just the French and the, and the, uh, and the British uh, background, but people of other backgrounds. And, and therefore, we extend the, the, uh, the policy of, of multiculturalism. And then I'll, I'll just end with, finally, I've obviously left out in my tale here of the colonial uh, period of the, uh, of the uh, Indigenous people. And, uh, and there is a, hist a different history of the relationship between the Canadians and the Indigenous people compared to the Americans and their Indigenous people. That's a chapter in a book. Uh, uh, but just looking at the Canadian story is that belatedly and fittingly <laughs> and, 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 and fitfully, we are coming up with a policy of mutual accommodation between the Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. The, the, the Métis, the Inuit, and the uh, First Nations people, and a, a lot of it is a very good court decisions, but a lot of it is the evolution of social values in which we're starting to show the kind of respect 
to indigenous people that we have been showing for the Europeans that came to this country. So that to me is kind of the story of Canada. Um, it, you know, it used to be Moose Mountains and Mounties and now it's, you know, multiculturalism, mutual accommodation, a Petri dish in which, um, um, in, in, in which we're trying to see if we can bring all these people together um, and, and to getting along with each other and even better than getting along with each other, like forming friendships with each other and intermarriage. And, you know, give me a call back in a couple of hundred years and we'll see what a Canadian looks like. I have a question from the audience um, about um, the respective countries' disparate approaches to public health measures, vaccine certifications, masking, so on and so forth. One of your slides suggests that in both countries, there's low deference, increasingly low deference to state authority. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question asks, is it a story of higher deference to civil service expertise uh, in Canada compared mm -hmm. to the U.S. and a story of a sort of general lack of deference to elected politicians in both countries? Um, so where is this? Um, where is the, the difference uh, stemming from, in, in, mm -hmm. in your view, if there's any, is it detectable? Yeah. And are, in addition, there are any political institutions that attract comparatively higher or lower degrees of respect in the two countries? Mm -hmm. uh, we will, I will be publishing something on this actually soon. So uh, probably within a week or two, because we, we've got some uh, updated uh, research. But if I had to make it kind of simple, like my quadrants, I would say that in uh, the United States, there has been a declining respect for politicians and a declining respect for political institutions. Um, the Supreme Court gets into trouble in the United States with Roe versus Wade. Um, and there are arguments that would be would, would suggest that it might have been better if the, that had been a decision taken by the House and the Senate, if the, if the elected representatives had, had actually make, made that decision. But with the Supreme Court making that decision, it really puts the Supreme Court under a question in the United States. We, we don't have Supreme Court decisions that have deeply divided the Canadian people. So the Supreme Court remains very high in respect in this country, whereas much more suspect uh, by people who feel that they're on the wrong end of a, of a Supreme Court uh, decision in the US. So in each country, there's a lot of, um, decline of respect for politicians and and the scoundrels that are in there and making stupid decisions and so on and, and the same thing in this country in canada you know we a prime minister is never more popular than before he or she is elected prime minister and after then it's sort of downhill until we we finally defeat them and then put another person in who's going to go through the same sort of thing but what we haven't found in canada is a decline in respect for political institutions. Federalism, our strong federal system and the division of powers between the federal government and the provinces is something that the Canadians support. A program called equalization in which money from wealthy people in wealthy regions goes to Ottawa and is distributed to the other regions of the country is supported by the majority across the country, even in Alberta, that feels a bit hard done by, especially at times when the oil and gas prices are down. So it's a pretty arcane concept, but the, but the concept of equalization allows for similar levels of education and healthcare across the country in all the provinces. If you look at uh, uh, the wealthy states in the United States, uh, Massachusetts, New York, uh, California, and then and then and then look at the uh, performance of uh, people in on uh, education tests and so on. You see a high, uh, a, a huge difference in the performance on the PISA test, the program of international student assessment of students in the poorest uh, states in the United States, particularly in the Deep South, and those who are in the wealthier states. We don't find that in Canada. The performance is going to be the same across the country 
And it is that way because we are a more egalitarian country. We more we believe in more spreading the wealth, having a similar standard of health care across the country. Some would say a similar mediocre standard across the country. That is probably true. Um, and, but still a standard that in the end, if you, you look at a number of indicators, I guess wait times is an indicator, but the ultimate indicator is how long people live, uh, mortality. And Canadians live about four or five years longer than Americans. Canadian men and Canadian women live longer than, uh, uh, than Americans. And that's kind of an, a part of the outcome of, uh, of having a, a universal, you know, accessible uh, healthcare system uh, where it, does, it, it isn't a function of how wealthy you are. It's a function of just your citizenship. And you actually you don't even have to be a citizen to access Canadian health care. So uh, that'd be, I, I think I've partly answered your question. Yeah. Another uh, a question that we have from the audience is um, uh, around um, how the two countries view each other as neighbors. Um, have your polling data uh, assessed um, whether or not uh, each country or people in each country consider the other to be a good neighbor? Um, mm -hmm. And do each, um, do, do people in each country um, think that the other would, uh, in a time of difficulty, come to its aid? Yeah. Uh, okay, you've seen, here's, here's what Can Canadians are thinking about the United States overall. If, if I, I, I'm sure I wrote a chapter about this, I would have started out by saying, Canadians um, have been ambivalent about the United States. Obviously, we formed our country in 1867 because we were a bit afraid that a militarized uh, North, after having defeated the South, uh, in where, where the British were more tilting toward the South, uh, would want to get even with the British Empire. And the place they could get even with was north of the border. They were militarized. They could have invaded the country and taken it over in two weeks, probably. Um, but they did not. And, um, and so, but it certainly scared the Canadians, the colonies that were here, and uh, inspired John A. Macdonald and Cartier and the other fathers of Confederation to get together and form a country, uh, because they said, we better get together and form a country. And of course, for John A., we better form a country and we better start um, moving west, or you know, the Americans are going to go move west, and we're, we're only going to have a very small country of of Ontario, Quebec, and the Atlantic uh, provinces. So Canada actually was formed as, as, as not being the United States. We want to form another country. And I think our attitudes to the US, you know, waxes and wanes. Um, and, uh, but it, it, I would, I certainly remember my parents' generation, it, the generation of, of people who, let's say after the first world war and going into the second world war and up to the Korean war and so on, would have admired the uh, incredible uh, consumer society that Americans created, the automobile, which we love those cars rolling off the Detroit assembly line every, uh, every September, um, American popular culture, everything from jazz to rock and roll to, I guess, rap today. Um, the, you know, we are the American movies uh, coming out of Los Angeles, the TV shows coming out of New York. There's just so so much of the materialism and hedonism of America was something the Canadians were very enamored of. And that would have been these numbers up here in the 80s that we admire the Americans for their enterprise, their innovation, and and um, um, and the the wonderful products and uh, products that they that they create. Uh, but as time has gone on. Um, and you can see in this more recent period, the politics of America has become to dominate our thinking about America. And so we kind of are dismissing, you know, the movies and the TV. And even though we're all on to Netflix during this pandemic, and we're more looking at America and its culture war, its low grade civil war that they're going on, that's going on between Democrats and Republicans. Uh, between uh, Trump states and, and liberal states and so on. Um, that, um, and then, of course, this whole uh, huge proportion of Americans who are anti-vax or, or questioning vaccination and questioning the science behind it. 
<laughs> even though it was the Americans who actually uh, create a lot of these vaccines and we benefit from that. Um, so that's where you get the Canadians today, 48, 46, uh, a mixture of, of so many positives uh, and, and now so many negatives that we are ambivalent. I don't think Americans are informed enough about Canada to really have a large number, 10 or 20% might have a view about Canada, but for the vast majority, again, Trying to figure out their own country is difficult enough, let alone to try to figure it now. We will be famous for our truckers in, um, in Ottawa, and they're going to wonder what's going on in the land, you know, the great white north. Um, and uh, we, could, we could talk about that. I mean, is this, a, is this, a, uh, is this, all, uh, is this all an American conspiracy? Well, that's not true. These, these mainly are Canadians. There may be a lot of American money. And there may be a lot of American ideas behind this, but it is a Canadian experience we're going through. Does it prove that our, our uh, democracy doesn't work? Not at all. Um, it's, we're kind of doing it the Canadian way. We're trying to, I don't know, we're trying to uh, take it step by step uh, and make sure there's no violence. We don't, you know, we don't want any uh, uh, collateral damage in doing this. Uh, but we are, you know, we're not only sick of COVID, but we're, we're we're sick of the restrictions, but we're now we're sick of uh, of the uh, the truckers, particularly ones blocking uh, you know, Detroit. So, uh, but so the Canadians, I think, again, the joke is that they were, we're kind of malevolently informed about the United States, whereas Americans are kind of benignly ignorant of Canada. I think that's uh, it's 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 a bit of a joke about being malevolently informed of, of the U.S. because I think there are a lot of us, uh, even those of us who are ambivalent. Who still have a lot of admiration. Uh, we have friends, business associates in the United States, and uh, and so there's going to be a lot of uh, empathy for uh, you know what is it like for those 75 million Americans who are just like us Canadians. It must be kind of lonely. <laughs> so another uh, a question that uh, comes to us uh, from the audience um, is posed about the role of religion in our national fabric. One of your slides points out that uh, the United States began as a secular republic mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now has transitioned to become very religious. Whereas mm -hmm. uh, in early Canada, um, we were uh, religious, certainly in Quebec, um, mm -hmm. but today that religiosity has, um, has become diluted and is perhaps on the wane so the question is, is about that transition. Why have uh, the two countries or religion in the two countries gone in, in opposite directions? But mm -hmm. at the same time, the questioner asks, um, why is the, if, if you have any view on why the relationship between the different religions seems to be about the same on each side of the border. So they're mm -hmm. seeing the, the divide um, according to your four box um, yeah. scheme seems to be about the same, uh, but just in, in slightly different registers, if you will. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, religion. Um, uh, I think Tocqueville, um, <clears throat> uh, when he came to visit, uh, Canada and the United States, I think he was looking at the prisons or there was some reason for him looking at, um, uh, at America. Um, Observe that, I mean, this is, a, this is a, a country that does not want government to be intrusive in the lives of Americans. It's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness with minimal government. And, and, and as for things like, you know, social solidarity and cohesion and meaning in life, well, that, that's, has, that's the role of religion. And, and so he, he felt that the uh, religion was very strong in, in holding Americans uh, together. Now, as time has gone on, um, uh, the theory about the decline of religion in Europe and in Canada is that the state has replaced the role of religion in taking care of people. So providing programs for people to take care of them in hard times or to alleviate poverty and so on. Um, we're not leaving it up to civil society in this country. The state is activist and, and religion is in relative decline. And uh, 
you know, I guess uh, uh, these, the, as education increases, uh, as questioning of traditional authority, patriarchy, religious authority is going on in both countries, but it, um, it has gone on in, at an accelerated pace in Canada. And again, people would say that's because in the 1960s, Canadians then became progressive and, and, uh, and found a very law, a large role for government in this country. Certainly the, uh, the change, the sea change in Quebec in 1955, you go to Quebec and everybody's in church. And in 1965 on Sunday, they're all, well, in the summer at least, they're at the, on the golf course. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it's really tough to get a tea time now. It's one of the, uh, one of the problems with this. But, um, and then English Canada similarly has seen the baby boomers questioning the traditional values of their parents. And uh, so Canada then has uh, become quite secular, uh, as secular as, as uh, Western Europe. Um, the same trend is happening in the United States that it is becoming increasingly secular. The Pew Research Center is showing this, um, but it's, and, and in particular among young people are starting to question. And so you're seeing a higher proportion of young people saying they're either agnostic or atheist or uh, have no religion. It's actually, it is actually the fastest growing religion in the United States, but it's among young people. And, uh, and it's older people who are clinging to uh, religion. Uh, the boomers and the elders are clinging to religion, but it, it, it is happening there as well. Um, the, the distance, if you look, I've got this map up, uh, the distance be, in terms of social values between Americans with no religion and conservative Protestants way up the map is a very large chasm in that country. Uh, the no religion versus the conservative Protestants and mainline Protestants in Canada, it's, it's less of a, of a deep divide of uh, social values. Um, these, people can, these people can sit around the dinner table together and, and get along civilly. It's more, it's more difficult in the US to have that kind of Thanksgiving dinner like in the 1950s. If, if people have, a, um, if you have somebody with no religion versus somebody who is a, a born again or a Christian fundamentalist. And of course, on the political debate, uh, you know, they, <laughs> Trump supporters don't have too many dinners with uh, Biden supporters in the same family, that's for sure. Well, one question that, uh, that comes to us uh, from uh, an interested uh, uh, participant is um, whether or not the uh, rural urban divide that exists in the United States might have something to do with this. And the question that uh, this person put is, is the rural urban divide that exists in the US as deep or as wide, or perhaps deeper or wider than it is uh, here in Canada? Do you have any, any thoughts about that? We've had data, we have data on this. Um, there is a difference, but it is not nearly as big a difference as it is in the United States and uh, the rural urban or the small town rural versus the urban. It's true that urban areas are more multicultural in Canada and multiculturalism rather than leading to the war of all against all actually leads to mutual accommodation and the, and the uh, celebration of diversity. But there's diversity in, uh, in rural uh, in Canada as well. And, uh, and so you look at voting patterns, they tend to, you tend to see the Conservative Party doing better in rural, small town Canada, but uh, Liberals can do well there, can do well there as well. And I think my example is Atlantic Canada, which is, and I, I hope I'm not offending um, anybody from that region, but it's it's a less wealthy region. It's a less um, you know less prosperous, uh, less manufacturing, and so on. But it is a region which has a very very liberal orientation uh, and a progressive orientation and an orientation to um, immigration and uh, and refugees. And if 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 Atlantic Canada is the equivalent in Canada of Appalachia in the United States, the mental postures of the people in those two regions could hardly be opposite. 
uh, with the Atlantic Canadians having uh, an openness, uh, almost a xenophilia toward other people, uh, wanting immigration, wanting diversity in their culture. And it's, it again is, is a more rural um, and, uh, and with, you know, the largest city is, I don't know, perhaps a million. I don't even know what Halifax is, but it, it wouldn't be anything more than that. So, um, so the divides of, um, th th there are divides between uh, urban and rural in Canada, but they're not as extreme as the difference between, you know, New York, Massachusetts, uh, you know, LA and, and San, you know, and San Francisco versus, let's say, the deep south, where the, the values divides are, are a huge uh, chasm uh, of uh, difference. Um, one question that uh, I think uh, intrigues a number of uh, a number of individuals is with respect to uh, demography and immigration. Uh, demography in both countries uh, is undergoing enormous shifts. Uh, in the U.S., the, the population now, uh, I think most recently under um, the most recent statistics uh, from the U.S. Census, census reveal, reveal that the population there is barely growing at all. Mm -hmm. um, immigration was way down during the um, Trump years. Uh, in Canada, we continue to rely on large numbers of immigrants to grow at all. Um, so our demography is, is also something that uh, has uh, experienced a hiccup. Um, what's your research um, revealed about different approaches and attitudes to uh, demography and immigration? Well, um, I, I'm most intimately uh, aware of Canadian because I've been tracking it now for about four decades. Um, Canadians continue to believe that the population should grow. They continue to believe that immigration is important. Their attitudes towards immigrants are that they don't take away jobs. They, um, they're good for the country. Uh, they, um, they, don't, they don't go on to welfare. Uh, they actually probably work harder than the average Canadian does. Um, the concern about immigrants is uh, that they're not adopting Canadian values uh, quickly enough, but even that attitude has diminished somewhat over, over time as people's experience with immigrants. Now remember, we have 20, what, 22% foreign born, 40%, um, 40% 40 plus first or second generation, people not just coming from Europe, but coming from around the world, huge numbers of people from South Asia, that's you know, India, uh, Pakistan, and uh, Sri Lanka, and so on, uh, China, and Southeast Asia, uh, great diversity of people coming here, and our uh, attitudes are that they should come, and they should come in numbers like 400,000 a year, which is roughly 1% of the population. That has not diminished, even with, uh, even with the, the pandemic, and, and if anything, attitudes are becoming more open, more liberal, more tolerant, and of course, we need this because without it, uh, the population would be static. Um, we are below replacement and America is not much above replacement. I think it might only be 2.1 or 2.2. And uh, in Canada, it's you know, like 1.8 or 9 or something. We need, so we need immigration. Canadians realize that. Um, and, uh, and, and it's both, um, both a pragmatic view of the Canadians that we need these people in order to have a robust economy, um, but we also think it's making a better country. It's, 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 the diversity is actually making us more interesting, uh, stronger, and a better country. Americans are um, uh, much more ambivalent uh, about immigration. Now, here you would say part of it is just luck. In the Canadian case, our good luck, our good fortune is to have three oceans and the United States next door. Um, we get a few, uh, we get, you know, there are some Americans coming to Canada, but there's not a, a deluge. They all say after they elect somebody like Trump, they're all going to move to Canada. Mom and dad say that. And then the kids say, well, you guys can go to Canada. We're staying here. <laughs> and so, so, and then you've got one partner wants to come, but then they, you know, they both have to get jobs. So they dream about it and they can, they can send me an email and I can tell them where they can live in Canada, where 
the values will be exactly the same as theirs, just to make them feel comfortable. I can match their values with the values of, of places in Canada. But um, so, you know, um, Canadians are, um, uh, well, uh, we're open. Um, it's in self-interest, but we also have the experience of people coming, coming to our schools, coming to our workplaces, and the direct experience is that, uh, boy, these people are great. They're, um, in, in many ways, you know, they're more hardworking and, do, and duty bound than are the, are the Canadians, but the people who've been here for three or four generations, they actually are, are helping the values of the country. So America, unfortunately, is living uh, next door to uh, Mexico, Central South America, with huge numbers of terribly destitute people migrating, coming to your border, and what we would call irregular immigrants. But, you know, uh, it's been estimated like 11 million uh, irregular uh, immigrants in the United States. It's a terrible, it's a debate you've been having. You've got Obama wanted to help the, what do you call it, the, the, the kids who were uh, illegals, uh, who had kids in the United States uh, to, to make them citizens. That's a big debate. So when you've got a lot of people kind of coming in uh, have, who haven't gone through normal uh, procedures, uh, which is the case in Canada, we only get a few thousand people coming in illegally into Canada. In America, again, it's huge numbers of people. So were we to be in a situation like the United States with a lot of Ill, irregular immigrants and uh, coming to the country, I think our attitudes would be uh, we'd have a far larger number of people with negative attitudes towards people coming to the country who haven't gone through the regular uh, immigration and refugee procedures. Okay, um, I have, uh, I think, uh, time for one last question, and it comes to us from the floor. Um, one of the, the points, and, and, and I put this uh, question to you gently, Michael, because I know that you're not trained as a lawyer, so um any observations that you might have um might not come from a uh might not come from a strictly legal perspective but the question is that uh during the pandemic we've seen many civil juries being um struck and civil litigation trials then are being heard by judge alone um and uh having a trial heard by a judge uh instead of a, a jury uh, seems to be um, in conflict with uh, the current view of uh, Canadians that uh, you surveyed who tend to favor uh, individuality over authority. Uh, this question asks and, and um, uh, is curious about whether or not or how can, can we ensure that the civil litigation uh, system in Canada continues to reflect the values of Canadians in, these, in this age of pandemic. Wow. So 1970, when I graduated from, uh, <clears throat> no, 69, from Queen's University in Political Studies, um, I should have gone to Osgoode Hall or the University of Toronto Law School. They let me in, and the worst decision I ever made in my life was to study sociology. No, that's not true. All my friends went to law school. A lot of them became politicians. We're still friends today. <laughs> but I went and studied sociology. Um, and yes, that's been my career and I don't regret it one bit. The law, um, we, we don't do very much research on attitudes towards uh, uh, the law in Canada. And, and I think the person who's put this question to me, um, this is going to inspire me to want to read uh, more about what would be behind this so that I could actually put some questions on a survey and put it in a context. I mean, we ask about confidence in the, you know, the criminal justice system and maybe confidence in the Supreme Court and so on. I can give you those numbers. Uh, generally, Canadians do have confidence. They have confidence in the police. Uh, they have confidence in the RCMP, generally, in spite of the fact that there are you know, uh, bad things going on in, in, in these institutions sometimes. Uh, but generally, uh, the Canadians, uh, it's interesting, again, we've, we've, we've uh, got rid of our deference to, uh, to, our, to our betters, to people, right, to 
somebody with a social status higher than us, like, you know, the priest or the, or the minister or the member of parliament or, or somebody who's in the, in the royal family or something like that. But we haven't lost our confidence in our institutions. And uh, so I would be interested in, uh, in, like, I've never asked, like, do you think that in these kinds of trials, should it be a judge making the decision or should this be a trial in which there is a jury of, of a representative number of people from the community making the decision? Um, there may be research on this. I think it would be very interesting. And I imagine that the Canadians, um, I can see them tilting uh, toward having more juries to have, rather than just deferring to a judge, a judge who, you know, uh, and especially let's say, because we've, we've had these, you know, there, there are always these cases, right? This is the law. The cases of, of judges on, um, on cases in which women um, uh, have been sexually abused, maybe even raped, and so on, with judges with anachronistic stereotypes of, um, of that woman. And, um, and uh, these have come to light. And I think, you know, a, a lot of Canadians would say, what are these older gentlemen doing making a judgment on something where their stereotypes are 100 years out of date? And, uh, and they would say, you know, this is a case where we should, where there should be a jury where we should, and, and half of the jury should be women. Who can, uh, who, can, who can bring a judgment to what a person who's uh, in, in that situation. So, uh, but I'm going on and the longer the answer is an indication that I, I don't really have, I haven't given it a lot of thought and I don't have a lot of data on it, uh, but maybe with your help, Kai, uh, you can uh, inspire me to think of a way in which I can uh, pose a, some uh, scenarios to a random sample of Canadians and uh, report back. All right. Well, um, Michael, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for uh, your presentation today, uh, which was a, a brilliant uh, synthesis of so many things that are happening uh, on both sides of the border between our two countries. Really helps to sort of encapsulate it all in a nutshell. Um, we put you on the spot, and in this format uh, that we have during this time of pandemic, it's of course. Uh, perhaps uh, not possible for us to have uh, the same sort of to and fro that we would normally in person. But uh, on behalf of the audience and behalf of the Institute, I wanted to thank you today, uh, both uh, the questions and the answers that uh, were posed and that were answered um, have been saved. And uh, we would like to thank you. And uh, I would like to thank the audience uh, for its attendance today. Uh, this has been a brilliant session. Uh, helping us to get right to the core of issues that divide our two countries uh, in, in the current moment. So thank you very much, and, uh, and uh, good luck to you and, and to your future endeavors. Well, I look forward to meeting you and uh, others face-to-face -face over a glass of Chardonnay. That's the best way to do Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. Bye now. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.